So now that we've looked at securing the underlying host as well as the software, it's time to focus our efforts on securing the network infrastructure itself. We have to understand the various network components and how to properly configure them in order to ensure the security for our organization. And in reality, as we look at the network, we might think that this is probably one of the most important steps in becoming a security professional because you know, a lot of our attacks are focusing on network technologies, on network components, on vulnerabilities in particular protocols, a particular type of communication like wireless traffic. So it is extremely important for us to know how to go about securing these elements. So let's start with looking at how to configure security technologies for the network. And the reason we want to start here is because it's impossible to fully secure a network without understanding the devices that make the network function. It's impossible to uh, be able to identify how communication happens and how to secure communication unless you know these particulars. Now, some of this should be review, especially if you're coming from Network Plus, uh, as to what these devices are and how they communicate, but it's necessary information before we move into the security aspects. So here's a table that has some common components that make up your network and just terminology that we will uh, use. A network device is any piece of hardware that is connected to the network computers, servers, printers, smartphones, as well as actual devices that perform networking uh, or have some function in networking like routers, switches, firewalls, etc. The media is the actual communication media that connects the devices to the network and carries data between the devices. Now on a local area network, this is typically going to be Ethernet as a standard for wired networks and then wireless or 802.11 Wi-Fi as a standard for unwired, non-wired communication. But of course we have, we have Bluetooth and NFC and we have fiber uh, and older style wired connectivity options. But the media is just, how do we get the data from here to there? We submit data onto the network via a network adapter. So that's hardware that translates the data between the network and the device. We have a network operating system, which is software that controls network traffic and access to network resources. And then we have a protocol. Protocol is a language of sorts. It's software that controls network communications. In reality, it's a, it's a set of rules that we use that define exactly how communication is going to happen. The individual devices themselves are going to uh, you know, vary as to what's being used in every single network. The vast majority of our networks today will at least use routers, switches, and firewalls. Some may also use proxy servers and others may use load balancers. We need to understand the functionality provided by each of these network devices so that we can see the importance of securing those devices. So let's start with the router, which is a device that connects multiple network segments, which are using the same protocol, and has the ability to forward packets from one network segment to another. It is connecting separate IP subnets, and so therefore routers are looking at the protocol addresses in TCP IP and using the protocol address to determine the route that a path or that a packet should take from source to destination. A router knows automatically about all of the network segments that it is directly connected to. And then it can use dynamic routing protocols to communicate with other routers to learn of other network segments so as to be able to determine the most efficient path for traffic to take. Now, most routers won't forward broadcast traffic from one subnet to another. Uh, and they also will generally all have the ability to control the type of traffic. By default, any traffic except for broadcast traffic would be allowed to and from an interface, but an access control list can be uh, established on a router interface, which can filter the type of traffic through the ACL. It can allow certain traffic and block other traffic. We can whitelist or blacklist. So I could you know, filter out particular inbound traffic from an external router uh, using a private IP range. Uh, we could also look at particular port numbers. And, and so, I mean, there's all kinds of things that can be done. Uh, that example is actually talking about a router that's connected 
and has an external interface, but it's rejecting any traffic on that external interface that has an IP, a source IP address that's internal. Why? Because that would represent a spoofed packet. And so that's not something that we want to do. Uh, access control list filtering is not the same thing as a firewall, but it's similar to the functionality that's provided by a firewall. And so you can use that to restrict the types of traffic that are allowed even inside the network. The next device is a switch. And, you know, traditionally a switch is a layer two device. We'll get into the OSI model a little bit later. But switches are layer two devices, which means they segment the network at layer two, which means it's based on MAC addresses. Okay, layer three devices like a router segment based on protocol addresses. So the switch's primary job is as a replacement uh, for the hub, which is a device that was used to connect individual systems. So the switch has multiple ports and individual devices will connect to that particular port and the switch will allow communication between these devices. Now, unlike a hub, it does not broadcast packets out all ports but it creates dedicated connections involving only two hosts in the transmission, thus getting around one of the primary disadvantages of the ethernet network architecture. It sends individual packets to a particular host and that's based on their physical address. So the switches will learn about the MAC addresses that are connected to each port, and then they will do direct communication MAC address to MAC address. Now some switches are technically layer three switches, in fact, a lot of switches are layer three switches, which means they can perform routing functions. They can actually uh, base things off of the protocol address. They can also set up what are called virtual LANs or VLANs. And those have the ability to control routing from certain network segments to other network segments. Uh, switches typically can perform some security functions as well. They can limit access to specific ports based on MAC addresses. So the switch may have like a white list of acceptable MAC addresses for a particular port. And then any device that has a MAC address that's not on that list is just not going to be allowed to connect. Uh, switches may also have flood guards to protect against denial of service attacks. So that protects against uh, SIN flood and the ping flood attacks. And they can also implement loop prevention to shut down network loops. A network loop is when multiple switches are connected to each other and they're bouncing traffic back and forth for an indefinite period of time. And that sort of has a, a multiplication effect and it can lead to a denial of service condition. So loop detection is built in using the spanning tree protocol uh, in a switch and that prevents the loops from happening. Switch is actually really similar to the older style bridge the difference, the main difference, the older style bridge was a layer two device that was really a replacement for routers. It, it just had individual ports. The switches have far more ports than the bridge and are a replacement for your hubs. Now, another network device that we find on networks, but one which is optional is a proxy server. You know, typically switches, routers, those aren't optional. We always have those. A proxy is a device that acts on behalf of another in a network communication. And it's primarily used for the, the purpose of being a forward proxy in that it intercepts client traffic before it leaves the internal network and then goes out to the web and gets information on behalf of the internal client. So when the web server responds, they're responding to the public IP address of the proxy server. They're not responding to the individual client computer. And this has multiple advantages. One, it gives us the ability to filter content. So if you're always going through the proxy server, then the proxy server can define rules as to the type of content that's acceptable out on the internet. And we can base that off of URLs, we can base it off content types, we can you know, prevent streaming media, for instance, prevent social networking, gaming websites, you know, those kinds of things if we, if we want. Um, and, and so, you know, that's one advantage. Another advantage is if everything goes through the proxy server, then you can have this central cache of web content. Uh, and then another benefit is everybody can use internal addresses. So I can minimize the number of public addresses that are needed by an organization by using the proxy server. Now the proxy can modify traffic or just forward it. Um, proxies can also act in the reverse. A reverse proxy intercepts traffic coming from an external network. And this is intended to protect internal servers from compromise. So a reverse proxy would intercept traffic, examine it, and then forward it on to the web server. 
So as opposed to the web server being directly accessible from the internet, uh, the reverse proxy can add some security functionality. Some proxies are multi-purpose. In fact, many are multi-purpose. Many have application level awareness of the traffic that's passing through them. And so those proxies can make decisions based on the, the nature of traffic, like translating IPv4 into IPv6, for instance, or determining where to forward traffic based on a particular URL as opposed to just a port number. So all of that is possible, and there are varying levels of functionality that are uh, available with proxy servers. A firewall is another device that almost every network is going to have some way, shape, or form. We're going to have hardware or software firewalls. These are the software-based firewalls are host-based. They protect traffic to and from an individual system. The hardware firewalls are network-based. They often sit at the perimeter and is a dedicated firewall that allows and disallows traffic to and from the internal network. We also have web application firewalls, which are specifically deployed to secure an organization's web apps and other application-based infrastructure from malicious traffic. But the concept of a firewall is the same regardless of the type of firewall that you have. It is a device that protects a system or network by blocking unwanted traffic, much like a firewall in reality would block fire from flowing from one area of the building to another, the firewall blocks traffic from flowing from one network segment to another network segment, or better said, allows you to define the exact type of traffic that you want. And then there's an implicit deny. And that means that the firewall mode by default is typically everything is blocked unless it's allowed. So we're automatically in a whitelist kind of scenario where we have to allow traffic for it to be allowed. Okay? It is implicitly denied. And sometimes that's just the default mode. Other times it's based on the fact that the last rule in a set of rules on the firewall is a deny rule that denies, you know, any source, any destination. Regardless of how it's implemented, it's still the same concept. So predefined rule sets as well as custom rules that you create will determine what traffic to block and what traffic to allow. Connection information can also be saved to a log for monitoring purposes. It's going to tell us, you know, show us the different kind of traffic that is going through that firewall. Now, there are different kinds of firewalls, as we said. Uh, there's also just a kind of a general concept of stateless versus stateful. Stateless tra firewalls don't track the active state of a connection. So it allows or blocks based on a static value like IPs, destination, source ports. Um, the stateful firewall does track the active state of a connection. And so it's able to make decisions based on the contents of the network packet as it relates to the state of the connection. So outgoing, outgoing traffic is not blocked. And if there's a response based on an outgoing pack, packet, then it's allowed because it's a part of that session. You know, so those kinds of things can be, uh, we see that that's actually implemented uh, out there in different types of firewalls. And then, of course, we need to mention that Windows has its own firewall. Uh, the Windows firewall has been present since Windows Vista in the operating system. It is a stateful host-based firewall. Uh, has the ability to protect both inbound and outbound traffic. So it's not the end-all, be-all, but it is something that will be implemented on most systems in today's networks. The next component is a load balancer. Load balancer is a network device that distributes network traffic or the computing workload among multiple devices. Uh, all devices can perform more efficiently because we are balancing the traffic and then individual devices are protected against a, dis a distributed denial of service. So really load balancers are twofold. They provide increased performance and they provide redundancy. Uh, well, I suppose they provide a third and that's this, you know, security related protections, but increased performance in that all the devices are answering at the same time. So three is better than one, you know, and so when I'm communicating with the load balancer, I'm communicating with a virtual IP, then the packets that are sent to that virtual IP are distributed between the systems that but reside behind the virtual IP address, okay? So that's performance. If one of those systems goes down, then I stop sending packets to it. That's, there's your redundancy. And if I uh, start getting, you know, denial of service hits, then the load balancer can kind of control against that. 
Scheduling is a term to define how the load balancer determines exactly where to route traffic. So there's a couple approaches. Round robin is a scheduling approach in which the load balancer just forwards traffic to each server on the list one by one and only skips one if the system is down. Uh, affinity is a scheduling approach in which the load balancer forwards traffic to a server that the client is already connected to. So that's a, a session type of uh, state or scheduling state. So that we often call it session affinity. And that works with web servers that hold and web applications that store session state. Okay. Uh, another kind of key here is you could act active active or active passive. So some of the devices behind the load balancer might not actually be used. In an active active mode, that means that your, uh, your devices are all active. In active passive, some of them might be passive. You could also have that same kind of terminology in relation to the load balancers themselves. So you have two load balancers set up in an active active configuration and you're now load balancing between the load balancers, which are load balancing between the machines behind them, or you could do active passive where it's just a backup, okay? Depends on the uh, performance requirements of that system. Here's a table that has some scanning and analysis tools that are used within a network, uh, and they function as security measures. We've mentioned, I think all of these actually, packet analyzer, uh, and protocol analyzer, those two are very similar at least, and in the vast majority of cases, they are the same program. Okay, a packet analyzer monitors wireless or wired network communications, captures traffic data, and can be used to gather information by examining packet contents, aka a sniffer. Okay, a protocol analyzer uses data captured by a packet analyzer, identifies protocols and applications used by the traffic and can real, reveal malicious traffic using specific vectors. Again, most programs that do this are both protocol analyzers and packet analyzers. A network enumerator, also known as a network mapper, is a device or program that's able to identify the logical topology of the network to uh, identify and show you the different connection paths that you have. It just kind of gives you an overview of the network architecture. One of the systems that we've mentioned a couple of times, but is definitely a network device related to security is an IDS, an intrusion detection system. This is a system that scans and evaluates and monitors the computer infrastructure for signs of an attack in progress. It can also analyze data and alert security admins to issues. An IDS can technically include a number of different components, hardware sensors, intrusion detection software, IDS management software. Each implementation is going to be very unique, and it will depend on the organization's security needs and the particular components that are chosen. Some of these cost money. Some of them are more open source. There are also different variants of IDS. You can't just say IDS in general. I mean, when you do, then we're just practically talking about a system that detects intrusions. Uh, a network IDS is a type that primarily uses passive hardware sensors to monitor traffic on a particular network segment. So it can analyze traffic, sniff traffic, and then send alerts about any anomalies or concerns. Uh, it uses rogue system detection. A rogue system is basically any system that's doing something that it shouldn't, okay? Uh, given out DHCP, a, a rogue wireless access point, a client that is uh, just acting suspiciously, the network IDS can spot those types of, of devices. They can also spot reconnaissance happening. Remember, an attacker is going to start by performing reconnaissance on the network. So, for instance, if somebody's trying to map the network or uh, I'm trying to do port scans, um, you know, other kinds of things, they can identify that. And they can also identify attack patterns like sin floods or other distributed denial of service attacks. So you have the ability to detect those. Uh, there's also a wireless intrusion deten detection system, which is a specific type of network uh, intrusion detection system that scans radio frequency spectrums for possible threats. And then you have host-based IDS or HIDS, which monitors a particular computer system for unexpected behavior or drastic changes. So NIDS, typical standard Ethernet, wireless IDS and host IDS. Those are your three major kinds of intrusion detection systems. 
The other type of device is an IPS or intrusion prevention system, which is essentially an IDS plus, okay? So this is a system that performs the functions of an IDS, but it can also take action to block the threats. Now, if the action that we're taking is a simple notification, then it probably still fits into the whole IDS realm. With IPS, we're actually taking some other actions, you know, configuring threats that should be handled automatically. Uh, there are still passive responses for implementing, for some incidents like just notifications and whatnot, but the, the active responses are going to be to block malicious traffic immediately. So I'm not gonna wait for IT to respond to an alert. I'm just gonna act. I'm gonna shut down that rogue system. I'm gonna stop this distributed denial of service. And that sounds all well and good, but there potentially are some pitfalls to that. False positives would lead to possibly the blocking of legitimate behavior. False negatives would lull you into a false sense of security. So in other words, we, we really have to monitor the IPS. If you have a very well-managed and finely tuned IPS, it is a powerful tool against defending against intrusions. An NIPS or network IPS is the type of IPS that can detect suspicious traffic on the network and move and block it. Blocking may involve dropping unwanted data packets, resetting the connection, or other methods. And uh, one of the advantages to this is that it can regulate traffic according to specific content because it's examining packets as they traverse the network segment. So uh, this is actually in contrast to the way that a stateless firewall behaves. Stateless firewall just blocks IP addresses or entire ports, doesn't even bother with the traffic contents. The IPS, network IPS can do that. And of course there are the wireless and the host versions of the IPS, just like there are those versions of the IDS. Now, when we get into these network monitoring, detection, and prevention systems, there are a few different methods that can be used. Some of them are signature-based, which means it's a system that uses predefined sets of rules to uh, identify events that are unacceptable. Unacceptable events then have specific and known characteristics, like how a port scan may complete a TCP handshake for each port on a system, and then they'll close the, the port. Anomaly-based is using a definition of expected patterns to events, and then it identifies events that are an anomaly that don't follow these patterns, and, it, and then it ap applies protective mechanisms. Now, this type would actually require a baseline, so you have to know what's acceptable. You have to teach the system what's acceptable before it can identify those anomalies. Behavior-based is identifying the way in which an entity acts, and then it's reviewing future behavior against that identification. So it can detect if future behavior deviates from the norm. This is similar to anomaly-based. It differs from anomaly because the latter prescribes a baseline for expected patterns. The, the, this one, behavior-based, just looks at the entity that's being monitored and develops those patterns more dynamically. And heuristic monitoring identifies the way in which an entity acts in a particular environment and then makes decisions about the nature of that entity based on this. It may conclude that the entity is a threat to the environment and then react accordingly, okay? So those are different options. And again, that's just kind of the way in which these detection and prevention systems will function. One of the terms that popped up in uh, the later objectives of Security Plus and Network Plus is Security Information and Event Management, SIEM. And an SIEM solution is there to provide real-time or near-real-time analysis of security alerts generated by hardware and applications. Okay, this technology is often used to provide us with expanded insights into intrusion detection and prevention by aggregating and correlating data from multiple sources. Uh, it technically doesn't define any one particular component. It's a, it's a group of, it's a solution of multiple services, software, hardware, cloud services, and it aggregates relevant logs to give you a holistic picture of the system. It correlates those logs to ensure that related events are placed in the proper context. Uh, it automates the process of alerting, um, gives us time synchronization, event deduplication, and then the write once read many functionality to uphold the integrity of security data. 
Another acronym and concept that we need to be familiar with is data loss or leak prevention, DLP for short. This is any sort of solution that will detect and prevent sensitive info from being stolen or falling into the wrong hands, okay? Uh, these systems can function at the network edge. They can also function on email servers. It just kind of depends on the particular situation, but it monitors data to stop unauthorized destruction, unauthorized movement, um, unauthorized copying of data from you to or from your users to outside the organization. A network-based example would be DLP being able to detect confidential files sent over email and blocking the transition. So we've got a rule on the email server that just says, hey, if the recipient is external and if the document contains this, these certain text patterns or content types, then we want to block it. Uh, and, you know, so we can certainly do uh, that, a host-based example, DLP could block a USB port entirely, or it could block certain files from being written to USB drives. Uh, it could prevent users from copying sensitive data to USB and leaving the premises. So DLP is really more of a concept. I mean, there are lots of different implementations of it. The concept is, is clear, and the implementation can be done in the hardware, software, or uh, using the cloud. A virtual private network or VPN has become a very common connectivity type of today's networks. This is a method of extending a private network by creating a tunnel through a public network like the internet. And now the tunnel provides a secure connection between two endpoints using tunneling protocols. Tunneling protocols will both encapsulate and encrypt data. Encapsulate means to place in a package. The package is the VPN protocol. The encryption is happening to provide confidentiality. We're utilizing the public internet, but we have emulated a point-to-point -point connection like those that exist on a private network. So these can be used for uh, connecting different branch offices and site-to-site -site VPNs where the two tunnel endpoints are the IP addresses of a router, routers or firewalls, or they can be used uh, as a remote access style connection. So a user on a laptop, home computer, or whatnot is making a VPN connection to the corporate network, authenticating, being authorized, and then being given an IP address that allows them to communicate with other resources on the corporate network and to do so securely. Often when we make a connection to a remote computer, especially for uh, remote access type of VPNs, we're using a VPN concentrator. A VPN concentrator is just a single device that incorporates advanced encryption and authentication methods and has the ability to handle a large number of VPN tunnels. So secure remote access or site-to-site -site VPNs the remote access VPN is one that's user to uh, organization, okay? Site to site is going to be uh, point to point between two VPN concentrators, routers, firewalls, uh, et cetera. These may have always on capabilities. I mean, technically, Microsoft's direct access technology is an always on style VPN service. Okay, where when the clients are connected to the internet, they automatically make this tunneled connection back to the, the corporate office. So you have different kinds here. VPN concentrators may be implemented via software and they may be implemented via hardware. Some devices are referred to as security gateways, and that's because it's a device that gives some sort of security control to network traffic before it leaves the private network and moves into the public network, although it can be uh, done vice versa. It's inbound or outbound network traffic, and there are different types of controls that can be uh, provided. A mail gateway is probably one of the more common ones. Uh, this is using spam filters to reject incoming email messages with known spam contents. Outbound, we can have DLP solutions that prevent data from leaking outside the network. And we can have uh, encryption mechanisms that help to ensure confidentiality and integrity of data as it leaves the, the network. These are typically third-party uh, devices, Barracudas, Postinis, Ironport, uh, Message Labs, etc. are some of the ones that can function with email systems. 
And security controls can apply to more than just email traffic. So for instance, you uh, can utilize these encryption and DLP technologies for media gateways, which translate streaming media between different types of networks that can contain voice communications or intellectual property that the organization wants to keep secure. Another component you should be familiar with is the Unified Threat Management, or UTM, which refers to any system that centralizes various security techniques into a single appliance. Microsoft had one of these for a while that was actually called UTM. Uh, Unified Threat Management Gateway was the actual name of it, but it's just a, you know, a combination of firewall, anti-malware, network intrusion prevention, anti-spam, content inspection, proxy server functionality is created in a response to cost and complexity that arises when you try to issue uh, or implement, I should say, uh, multiple systems. So this can streamline the security process. It can make the management of defenses easier. The downside is it's a single point of failure. You know, and so if that system goes down, then a lot of your connectivity goes down. And not only that, but you can struggle with latency issues because we're relying on that particular system and, and so much of our network connectivity is going through that one system. So it doesn't have, it's not all uh, bells and whistles here. There are some disadvantages, but Unified Threat Management Gateway Systems are a combination of a lot of these products. So let's finish up with a summary uh, for configuring network security technologies. We summarize some of the, the concepts that we've talked about. We need to familiarize ourselves with common network devices and their security concerns if we are to successfully implement security controls. Uh, we need to be able to implement network scanning technologies in order to identify uh, the you know protocols that are being in use, the security mechanisms that are in place in order to stay up to date. Network intrusion detection systems will help us to identify unwanted network behavior. And we can use intrusion prevention technologies to take a, a further step, but we do want to be aware of the risk, especially with false positives, well, false positives and false negatives. Uh, consider importing or incorporating SIEM technology into the organization that helps us to aggregate and correlate information about network-related events. DLP solutions can help us to prevent unwanted loss or leakage of a sensitive information. VPN technologies can be used for remote access as well as site-to-site -site connectivity, and they authenticate and encrypt traffic, but we should consider using a VPN concentrator if we have more complex environments requiring higher performance, and then possibly consider the always-on functionality for clients connecting to a VPN, uh, technologies like direct access uh, from Microsoft. Okay. We can incorporate security gateways in the network to better control the state of traffic that enters and leaves the private network, and then we can consider using a UTM to streamline device management, but we do want to be aware of the risk involved with uh, unified threat management. So as I said, these uh, little guidelines are more of a summary than anything else, helping us to summarize some of the topics that we have discussed.